And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from SideQuest Press, creators of the upcoming setting Lost Lights for both Pathfinder 2nd Edition and D&D 5th Edition, the one and only Anthony Barajas, and I just I just realized I, fl I flubbed the last syllable, sorry about that. No, I think you did better than you actually beforehand, you, <laughs> that, that was perfect, you got the R roll and everything. Which is saying something, because I can't roll my R's worth a damn. It wasn't bad. Yeah. But how, how are you doing tonight, man? I'm, I'm great. It's hot here. Uh, tired, but I'm doing, I'm having a good good week so far. Hmm. And uh, it's a pleasure to be to be on. Thank you so much for taking the time out. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So, a tradition, around, a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. With that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? <laughs> uh, wow, that's that's interesting. Uh, I might have had two or three reintroductions because of the way it all panned out, but the original one was uh, sixth grade, just going to school and a friend bringing, I have to say, at that point it was AD and D to uh, to school and. Th Playing as oh no 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 actually it started with Hero Quest if you're familiar with that board game I am he brought he brought that to school we played through that a few times we realized that the uh, the game was fun but maybe not robust enough complex enough for what we wanted to continue playing with so then he brought AD and D we played that a little um, and that was cool we played for sixth grade like half of sixth grade and then my mom who was highly religious and still uh, affected by the after effects of the satanic panic decided that it was not something I was allowed to play. So that went away and then I didn't vi revisit it until I graduated high school. But that was that was my fun experience and a fun and a fun initial memory beyond of course the fallout, you know, from 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 what I said, but yeah, it was it was fun. And we didn't know what the hell we were doing for the most part at that age, but we had a lot of fun with it. Now so so that so with that be you said that you said that there were multiple um re, that there were multiple reintroductions. Right. Um do you remember what? Do you remember what came at, what came after that incident? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, you know, after graduating high school, just a little bit after, I just uh, as, as part of the overall package of rebelling against my upbringing, I decided I was going to look back into it because it was something that I had fun doing. Mm -hmm. So, and I still, you know, maintained my my geekdom along the way in reading novels and video games and staying within fantasy confines and sci-fi stuff. So, I uh, went on the Wizards of the Coast message boards which i don't even think exists anymore but at the time the, old, the were... old ones some people some people have archived parts of it but the archives only go so far and right i think some parts of it are still on the Wayback machine right so i i, I went on there and they were looking for group posts and found somebody local and joined a group that did not work out well um uh how do i put this like they were just uh very not the type of gaming group that I would work well with. I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. And, uh, but, but, uh, so I went to visit them once, played once, and then said, I'm not going to do that. And then went right back on the message board, found a different group, joined that one. And that, that gaming group, uh, introduced me to Dariush, my business partner for, in, for SideQuest Press and the gaming group that I run with today. So that's something like, uh, 15 years with that gaming group consistently playing every other weekend, uh, since then. And, a large part has to do with the fact that, and, and I think everyone should have fun in their own way and be their own person. Mm -hmm. The large part has to do with this group was primarily <laughs> uh, standard, everyday, regular people who had jobs, had careers and marriages and families, and then liked to play the hell out of some D&D or later Pathfinder on the side. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a very uh, welcoming experience and a lot of, and a lot of, uh, you know, we weren't, we, it wasn't a way of life. It was our, it was our hobby. So for some people it's not, it's more, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that group has been really kind and we've got, I mean, these guys went to my, my wedding and uh, were my best men and stuff like that. So it was cool. Yeah. So that brings, that brings me to, to Lost Lights uh, proper. Now, 
the f now um before before I get before I get into the the crunchy end end of the equation, um, how did the how did the idea for Lost Lights as a campaign setting um come about? So we this is a setting. Huh, let's see. So for the longest time, that group played uh, in the settings, uh, official settings of Wizards and then later Paizo. And those are fun. We we have a soft spot in our heart for, especially for me, for Dragonlance. And we had a great 1 through 20 campaign we did in Eberron that lasted multiple years. But eventually we wanted to start writing our own world. And we went about it in an interesting way. Well, Dariush and I uh, are aspiring novelists, which means that aspiring word being key there you know we have a lot of stuff written but nothing even in remotely a, a, a manner that it can be released as far as novels go mm -hmm. and and we wanted we, just, we said hey let's uh let's create a shared world that we can write in and put these books out and and we can play in it as well and as we started playing in the world and you know as you know many of the most popular settings uh pu you know published settings started at a table somewhere at a kitchen table or a garage table mm. where people started from you know the first level characters that are in a town and then as they got you know you go through the campaign you build outwards and then eventually you have a world that's how this one naturally progressed as well and our the rest of our players um older and newer decided or insisted that they wanted to see more and more of it and that uh it was really high quality maybe something we could publish and as we asked that question to others and introduced it we realized that we it was something we could make something of and and you know speaking back to Dragonlance and other campaigns that are highly eurocentric those are fun and they're great there's a lot in them that we love mm -hmm. and and there's a lot in them that we've seen a lot of so the thing that made us cross the line from talking about for for years for i mean you know five or six years talking about publishing this to actually doing it was just the lack of any consistent um settings based on the mythologies and histories that we wanted to that we had been basing ours off of so we decided i think enough people want to see this that we should go ahead and publish it that's where we are yeah um now since now since you had meant since you had mentioned um both dragonlance and eberron um a bit of a curiosity that i have is in the early phases of this was one of your ideas to try and try and try and mesh those two particular um styles together since Dragonlance is very um, tip, typical, high, typical high adventure, whereas Eberron is a bit more um, tech punk. That's actually really interesting. I, if that happened, it happened subconsciously because you mentioning that is the first time I thought about that. Um, I, we wanted to do something different because that's kind of the point of it all, right? Mm -hmm. And so we knew we were going to do something different with the Mesopotamian, Mesoamerican. Uh, some Eastern Asian background elements that we have as far as the default culture setups, or I should say props that, that everything or that everything is um, set up against. Canvas. And then we thought, there we go, thank you. And then we thought about how we could make it different from uh, from a technological standpoint or from a, a theme standpoint. And I think that's key that you mentioned that Dragonlance and Ebron have key underlying themes as you described them. So what we what we wanted to do was have, yeah, like a technological, higher technological Victorian era industrial revolution mix, laid in uh, from a sorry from a technology standpoint, laid into our main con or and when I say our main content is the first one we started writing for I should say, um, which was Nadaj Way, the one that's the one that's primarily based off of Mesoamerican Mesopotamian lore, and then we, after doing a lot of that, we 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 really wanted to have a high fantasy setting within it as well, which is why we drew, created kind of a dual setting with the two main continents and how different they are. The result though, you're right, is that is that one is a little bit akin to Eberron and one is a little bit akin to Dragonlance, which would be that high fantasy, um, almost, almost you know, Bronze Age to, to uh, the Dark Ages type setting. So yeah, no, no plan in that, but that's, that's, that's kind of how it ended up. That's interesting. Oh. Some something that something that I've learned over the years is that when a lot of people sit down to actually do this, there t there typically isn't a plan. There's just a ser there's just a series of what if questions. Um, and I I will admit that one of the one of the other things I was somewhat reminded of, what, especially when it came to the aesthetic, 
is um, RuneQuest. I'm uh, I'm not entirely sure if you're familiar with that um, ven with that venerable entry in in um, tabletop. I've heard that word, but I that one I'm not familiar with at all, actually. Um, well, first, RuneQuest um, is a is a very old and venerable name in um t in tabletop. Um, it's cr and Staff Stafford, cr who cr who created it, um, was d was doing was doing something that was heavily in heavily inspired by the Fertile Crescent. Okay. Um, when it came when it came to his approach, instead instead of instead of going with Western Europe the the same way um the same way Tolkien did. Right. Um, on the other on the other hand, um, RuneQuest is nuts. <laughs> You have a world literally on a literally on a cube in a cosmic ocean, and that's oh. one of the saner thing. That's one of the saner things within it. But it's more of the. But the reason I bring up RuneQuest is even though there is that heavy inspiration of Bron of Bronze Age, um, fertile fertile crescent, um, early antiquity style civilization. That's not that's not where it begin. That's not where it begins and ends. Um, okay. And in the same way, from what I've seen of Lo from what you're telling me with Lost Lights, even though, even though you had even though you had started with um, with the with the Middle East and La and Latin America, um, that was that was that was more of the that's more of the first step into what you ended into eventually it becoming its own thing, just using those as a base. Right. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. I'm looking at RuneQuest now. It looks very interesting actually, but yeah, we, uh, and, and that's, and that's, uh, you know, there are no new ideas under the sun is the phrase. Um, but yeah, we definitely started with saying, you know, let's go with non-Western, non-Eurocentric setting. Let's start with that. And then we say, what do we want to go with this? And we, we went from there and, and it's stacked upon itself until you get to a point. Now, obviously, you know, the, the allegories we're drawing are, are interesting, but of course these aren't, these aren't Eberron and they aren't um, Dragonlands in any more than maybe that that thematic backdrop that you're talking about because there's probably not much else that's familiar um, other than you know the the foundational things that go along with technology level or high mm -hmm. magic level. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that was the re that was the reason I used the uh, the analogy of a um, of a canvas. Um, but one. One of the one of the major things that I, that I had seen was was the whole um, division division between two two figurative and literal worlds. Right. On one on one hand, you have a very tr you have a very fan you have a very fantastical end of, and and on the other hand, you have what you called a um what you called a techno theocracy. Right. Um. Now, when it comes when it when it comes to when it comes to the those respective regions um where would you where would you say their their relative tech level is putting aside the magic end of things okay yeah that's fun uh mainwar the eastern continent uh sorry western continent mm -hmm. is is much easier it's uh it's middle ages uh standard high fantasy no no firearms no working mechanism technology of any sort um and then the bronze element is thrown in there specifically because there's a story reason why there's no iron on the entire continent and mm -hmm. it's it magically disappeared uh during a, an area an area of time before recorded history mm -hmm. so uh they use magically uh enhanced bronze there primarily but technologically why technologically it's it's closer to, to the middle ages dark ages now uh nadaj our way is an in, more interesting answer. I think it's uh, <laughs> it's some hodgepodge of industrial revolution. To there's there are even some technological elements that are early 1900s, and the reason for that is uh, we didn't want to we didn't want to just create a direct analog to a real world uh, technological advancement stage mm -hmm. uh, because. All of these things happen differently when you introduce different elements. I mean, things are invented when they're needed and not beforehand generally, which is kind of the point. Um, and on the Dajar way, uh, long story short, the gods there, a la Prometheus bringing fire, brought the basics of technology to humans probably a, lo a lot long time before they would have come to them themselves. So that 
thrust them into a new era technologically. So it's, it's a little bit from all over the place. They're still using, uh, you know, Kopeshes and other hammers and melee weapons and such. But uh, you've got railroads and um, balloon boats and firearms that probably shouldn't exist at the same time period, or I should say, let me rephrase it, wouldn't have existed in the same time period generally in real life mm -hmm. because you've got breech-loaded and uh, mag-loaded firearms and other other things that you know would generally replace each other if they were introduced over a longer time frame. So, but yeah, that's a much longer answer than I guess was necessary. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, you know, Industrial Revolution to, to early 1800s for the most part, and then some random like telegraphy and other elements that weren't, weren't there until a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to now something something that some something that I find I find in, I find interesting when it comes to when it comes to Nanjarwe. Um, I get again. I I said I was gonna mess up pronunciation at at some <laughs> point, so can't can't fault can't fault me for for truth in advertising. Um. Is the fact that you call it a techno theocracy? Um, now, is now um, what exa what exactly do you what exactly do you entail by that by that particular setup? Because the idea of a technocracy is something that would be familiar to some. The idea of a theocratic state is something that would be f that would certainly be familiar to some. Um, but the idea, but a techno theocracy is so is something. That's certainly going to be out. That's certainly going to be outside the expected. Um, right. How do you how do you define that kind of setup? And so you know, as you as you already alluded to, that's essentially a made up uh, portmanteau, right? That, that we threw together. But but the way we would I would describe it is it, it is indeed a theocracy. Uh, there are eight nations there that make up the vast majority of that continent, almost almost in, you know the entire continent that are part of the holy hegemony, which is a theocracy ruled by. A pantheon of of polytheistic gods that show up in human form and uh, mingle with the with the mortals, uh, or at least they did until they disappeared recently. But that's a mystery for another time. The technological element is there because, uh, as I men mentioned earlier, the gods introduced technology to the humans of the Dajarwe, and the theocracy uh, is run by Hayashi, which is essentially a. Um, Constantinople or even Vatican style um, independent state within one of the nations uh, ruled by the high reflection or the grand reflection, I should say, which is the head of the church. And uh, their army is in all eight nations and uh, keeps order, but also regulates access to technology. So uh, even though technology is rather ubiquitous, it's still uh, only, only in the hands of those who are approved by the by the church. Mm -hmm. So, we call it a techno theocracy because it's a cool portmanteau of the two different types of control uh, get mechanisms, but also because the religion itself and the the gods uh, themselves are tied directly into the technology. Um, even to the point where every citizen has to wear a bracelet called a solar ID, which signifies what you're licensed to do own and uh, perceive yeah when now when you when you mentioned when you mentioned that relationship between the religion and the technology um the some of the some of the things that come to mind with that are are say the, are say the 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 kind of the kind of te the kind of techno technologically focused clerics that you might see in say dune or the or say the tech priests in um, Warhammer Forty Thousand, um, as well as well as the as well as the computers that 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 were seen in a lot of um, Asimov's work. Would that would that not be too far? Would that aside from being different tiers of technology, would that not be too dissimilar? No, I actually I don't think uh, that's a great question. Uh, it really is, um, but I think the answer is that, th that it's actually not too similar to this. So at the expense of sounding like a, a fake uh, nerd here, um, one of the very few IPs I've never touched on is Dune. But my business partner, who is not here with us right now, uh, knows all about it. It's one of his favorite settings. So if there are similarities there, they're probably, they bled through subconsciously through his writing. Mm -hmm. But Warhammer 40 I'm very familiar with. And the tech priests, I see what you're getting at. And so the idea of, me of mechanization of, of technology being a part of the religion, like a holy item, 
mm -hmm. uh, being something to worship in and of itself is not present here. So that's a great, that's a great question for, for the sake of knowing, you know, getting the answer that it's not present here. No, yeah. no, this is, this is more like um, technology is viewed as a gift directly from the gods and therefore should be regulated and controlled, uh, given access only to those who have the proper faith and connection to the gods and to the church. Mm -hmm. And so you will indeed see reflections, which are the word for priests here. You will indeed see reflections and other members of the church, like the holy quaestors, which are your inquisitor analogs. And that might actually be, by the way, they might actually be closer to what inquisitors are in 40K than any other analogy we've drawn so far. But um, having church officials, government officials, and specifically licensed individuals having access to this stuff mm -hmm. is perceived as being blessed by the gods to be allowed to have it. That's probably the closest link it comes to, as opposed to the examples you gave where I think technology itself is almost worshipped, right? So that's a great question. That made me think about it more yeah. than I had in the past. Mm -hmm. um, now, since you mentioned the Quaestors and you compared them to the Inquisition, that's something I did want I did want to touch on because um, an, inquisit an a Inquisitor... Or a or a um or in the fantasy equivalent a um, witch hunter, um has has nearly unlimited um po political power. But the but the check is the the check is the fact that some is that an inquisitor you uh, abusing their power might interfere with the plans of another inquisitor who might have them um fall down a flight of accidents if you follow me. Right. Um. Is there is there a similar is there a similar kind of contr control structure with the quaestors where they ha where they have a lot of pull but but they end but they end up watching each other just in case one ends up screwing up ends up screwing screwing into the other's plans. Yeah, absolutely. So the quaestors are um, you know we talked about there being no new true ideas, but you know you've got the 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 inquisitors of forty k, mm -hmm. you've got um, the mord sith in. Terry Goodkind's works and the operative in Firefly. And you, you've often got um, independent groups like that, secret agency groups uh, that are there to investigate. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have a large purview. That is the case here. So Quaestors always run in threes. Mm -hmm. uh, they're assigned a group of three, ostensibly, so that those three can balance each other out. They're usually from different nations uh, and maybe even different lighthouses. I can talk about lighthouses in a minute, mm -hmm. uh, which I should have mentioned earlier, actually. Um, and, and they're there essentially to check each other when they run in these threes. But that doesn't always work. Uh, while there's very few infighting amongst the three, uh, you will in fact see Quaestors declare someone uh, heretical and then have another another Quaestor declare that that first Quaestor was heretical for declaring so, and then you have some problems, right? So that is something that does happen, although relatively infrequently. One example, uh, which fits right into your question is, we're running a, a stream right now um, with, I don't know, do you mind if I mention a different, like a, 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 a stream, streaming, Twitch go streaming ahead. group? Go ahead. Okay. So we're, there's a group called Band of Badgers, and that's not even necessarily to shout them out, although they are great. Mm -hmm. But just to say, we're running a stream with them right now that uh, we were wrapping up. It's a little four shot wrapping up uh, on Sunday. And they're dealing with this very issue where, uh, uh, this is a spoiler, so hopefully they listen to this afterward, that there's a Quaestor uh, hunting them who is trying to keep the one church from uh, research that they're doing on uh, extra planar portals that might lead them into the dominions because since the gods have disappeared, they're wondering if that's where the gods have gone. So you have Quasars working against the active will of the one church itself. Uh, and so that would cross over into not just acting under purview and with independence, but into being, you know, maybe declared radically heretical by the church itself. So there's there's a lot of that going on behind the scenes too. They're definitely secret police with a lot of power. Mm -hmm. Now, when now because of because of the because of the wild, wildly um wildly varying le levels of technology, um I've seen I've seen some games implement a a t a tiered setup of tech levels like say um the genesis does that does that kind of thing in it in its system because of the differences between technology between different cults um how do you have do you have something similar when it comes to codifying tech when it comes to codifying tech levels and how how do you how do you make sh how do you make sure that there's a degree of um degree of balance so it's not just a race to get high tech material yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the in in real life you had 
uh, guns alongside armor and swords in, in real life battles. So we weren't too worried about our technology levels varying too much. Certainly there is a, a gap still between the two continents. Mm -hmm. So let me say it like this, I guess. On um, Nadajar Way, the technology level is pretty is pretty even across the nations because it's, you know, the holy hegemony and the technology is there. Um, on Main War, there being that lower level of tech, but a higher level of magic to balance it out, our, the point of that and the way we wrote it was to try to establish that magic itself is a technology. So, you know, we view magic as this magical thing uh, in fantasy because it's it's so otherworldly and it's a large part of the reason why many of us even started getting into it. But in, in many ways, it's a technology in itself. You, you do race, uh, there is an arms race of sorts and you do continue to try to get better, more powerful magic to protect yourselves, your homes, your nations, your families, right? Mm -hmm. So... So, you know, in some pretend uh, setup where Main War and Nadaj Harway clashed, um, we did try to set it up that the power levels would be pretty close. Although the the type of might they might bring to bear or the type of even non-combat technology, right? You know, medical field advance, et cetera, would be similar across the way. So with that said, no, there's no rules-based codification of technology levels. Um, we put a giant difficult dangerous ocean in between and then of course on the dodge our way one of the things that the church does uh, to maintain its control over technology is absolutely forbid anyone from ever visiting the other continent or coming from the other continent obviously nothing is fail fail safe right or foolproof so uh the people slip through but for the most part that's how technology is kept separate mm -hmm. and of, co of course some um... Of course, Always. even even, right? even yeah. with that, um, smugglers are still going to be a thing, right? Yeah, and and the dominions I mentioned earlier, which just another uh, the word we use in our books for the the plains, um, there are those who can travel great distances by crossing through those dominions. So mm -hmm. certainly, some stuff has been smuggled overall. You have issues, of course, um, even if tech technolo technology based on you know iron and steel gets to Mainwar, there isn't any there to replace it with. So volume is an issue, Repair, you know, access to repair materials is an issue, access to understanding of the technology is an issue. Um, and then vice versa, if you bring any sort of high magic stuff over to Nadashar Way that's from Mainwar, um, good luck on the Quasar's not finding you too. So that's kind of the artificial uh, difference that we put there to separate them. No, and no, they Do not, do not worry to... about do not worry about language. <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, so yeah, so they can feel free to do with that what what they wish. But we set the framework as such. Mm -hmm. Now, when it <clears throat> when it come when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the setup between them, like I've um <clears throat> a long a while back, I had Chris Diaz on, and he's done a ma a magic versus technology setting in um, amethyst and one of the things that he did is to kind of keep a balance between the two is um magic interferes with the presence of magic interferes with technology and make and makes it malfunction or br or break down the two aren't c the two aren't um compatible right. um is there is there is there some similar sort of catch with your with your system or is or is the idea of somebody going full um gish and bringing in and having bits of magic and technology a possibility yeah you know it's funny i i read uh something about that a while ago and as we start after we wrote quite a bit uh darius and i met together because we you know, obviously meet regularly and we talked about exactly what you just described <clears throat> and we looked it up and we read that it, it had been done and you know uh, i'm not surprised because it's a good idea where magic itself disrupts technology and vice versa mm -hmm. and we felt that for the sake of our story we actually started writing mechanics for it and talking about it and then after reviewing it a bit decided we didn't want to go with it so <clears throat> we actually had a point where we were writing rules for firearms and technology and disallowing them to be enchanted and you know exactly what you're talking about but in the end we decided that it wasn't really an issue the the control mechanism for magic versus technology or magic with technology is is uh societal um and pragmatic as far as the distance between the continents goes so 
on the dodge our way specifically we had one player in a recent game that we we streamed you know a, a few months ago he that's exactly what he made he made a, a makiziki which is our word for uh you know mechanist or or, or you know it's a it's an archetype for our pathfinder 2e version or a base class for our 5e version mm -hmm. and he made that who was also a wizard right and so he did exactly what we're talking about he had he had a he had a, a mechanical companion like an automaton that walked around with him oh that would probably be the thing i should have mentioned earlier is probably the most technical technologically advanced um out of anything is the idea of a t automatons at all right mm -hmm. but but um yeah he had that he had magic he mixed it all together and had some fun with it and we just went ahead and said you know screw it um magical weapons can be enchanted like non-magical or sorry technological weapons can be enchanted like non-technological and we'll check the balance from there and through you know two years of play testing we've found what we're comfortable with but yeah you can definitely build that yeah now give, given given that given that kind of set given that kind of setup this brings on um on my on my in my temple um, it is a it is certainly an uncommon thing to see uh, to see at a certain project get adapted into both um, D and D fifth edition and Pathfinder second edition. Um, what 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 came what factored into the decision to cover both of them, and what have been some of the um, what have been some of the easy parts and some of the hard parts to uh, to adapt between the two, since they are since they are very different affairs. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we, Dariush and I, uh, have always been D&D &D players, um, but, and I, I was exclusively a D&D &D player for the very longest time, and he, but he did other stuff, Vampire and GURPS and all sorts of other things that he had played for a long time, and once Pathfinder First Edition came out, we played that to the ground, and then when Pathfinder 2E came around, I was enamored with it, I just, I, I love that system, and I brought him around, and he said, okay, this is pretty good, and he slowly liked it more and more. And with 5e, um, it's a fine system. I think that it could be greatly improved with the next edition um, with a little more complexity. But that's a discussion for another time. What, As it applies to what we created here, we, we wanted to build our setting for um, what our group was playing and what we perceived most people were playing. So Pathfinder 2e had been taking off, and it still is taking off and doing well. And 5e surprised us in our early design process because of everything that the major um, streaming groups did for it, right? Critical Role and all these other groups that made it uh, almost pop culture again. I mean, I, that's probably a bit of a stretch, but certainly raised awareness on Dungeons and Dragons quite a bit again. So, so we decided it would it would <laughs> serve our selfish purposes of wanting to play this stuff in Pathfinder Second Edition, and the pragmatic purpose of putting out for Five E to reach the greatest audience and to put it out there for people who wanted to play it. Because look, like you know, like I said earlier, the main reason we wanted to do it is because of representation. And I can preach on this for hours, but I won't. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea that we both wanted to see something that hadn't been seen before, or rarely is seen, and something that represented our backgrounds and kind of took a, a, a hard turn off of the standard Western Eurocentric setting. And we thought it, we should put it in both settings. And of course, once we did research and found that places like Drive Through RPG and others allow for print on demand and some really uh, agile processes by which to get these things printed, we realized we could do that, right? Mm -hmm. So, so we know that a lot of people who want to play Five E don't want their Pathfinder mechanics in it, and the people who play Pathfinder don't want Five E mechanics in it. People have their favorites, and then we also have the option for people to get both in one book because of the way that print on demand works. So, it was it. It was about reach, and it was about. Uh, the two systems that we play wanting to play this stuff in it because we uh we alternate um bi-weekly where we play a 5e game and a pathfinder 2e game and i don't necessarily see that changing anytime soon mm -hmm. now when it comes to the, when it comes to the um when it, com when it comes to the mat when it comes to the magic getting getting to setting to a bit because i realized that there was something i didn't um cover in order to balance this out getting to the magic end of main noir um, oh yeah how is is since you mentioned mad since you mentioned the treatment of magic as a technology is is it re, is it relatively commonplace to the point where um where where um 
where at where magic is a every is a everyday thing, or is it still on is it still somewhat on the level of the magic practitioner hold hold off and hold off in some place way way out from civilization? Right. Actually, I think I can answer this one really well by tying it back into your last question because I just realized that I didn't completely even answer your last question. So let me say this: the cool thing about Mainwar is, uh, and and the main reason you know I spoke earlier about how we wanted to make Nadaj our way because of its canvas and because of the technology aspect that we wanted to make a focal point of it. On Mainwar, it, it wasn't a side, it wasn't an afterthought. What we also really wanted to do was uh, represent the idea of race as it's been presented in fantasy gaming for the longest time. Aside from the discussion on whether the word race is even properly used uh, in, in, in campaign settings, um, is the idea that uh, r the races have always been kind of shoehorned. Uh, going back to first and second edition, where literally some races were classes, <laughs> is, is its own separate issue that got better and better and easier to deal with as we got to 3.5 and, uh, and other editions. So answering your question on, on why Mainwar needed to be there, and then answering your question on magic and how ubiquitous it is, is how we answer that. So the short, the short of it is Mainwar thousands of years ago. Um, the progenitor race there that has be you know, that was the mortal race that lived there, who's as yet unnamed because it's not relatively important in its prehistory, was uh, modified genetically through magic experimentation and, and arcane arts by otherworldly Ahura and Deva, who arrived and uh, sought the power of divinity that is somewhere on Mainwar. And so we we use that flavor in a, in a designing top-down setup to create what we call lineages. And those are magical lineages that are present in every everyone on main war and so you might have an innkeeper who's a dwarf um you know phenotypically they, they look like a dwarf but they have merfolk uh, lineage and that allows them to grow gills and breathe underwater or you might have um a merfolk uh stable boy who can breathe fire because he has draconian uh, or uh, i should say dragonborn lineage so what that allowed us to do was uh, break down the idea of race and ancestry, but then also make magic so ubiquitous that it is indeed everywhere. And so when it's such a base part of everyone's lives, that's where it becomes like technology and that uh, people are advancing it naturally. And also, yes, there are wizards high up on floating citadels advancing it through uh, and you know research and uh, production. Yeah. Um, a big reason why a big reason why I asked that kind of thing is because of a issue that's, um, been, that's been a bit pervasive in a, in a lot of um, fantasy games, and obviously some are are bigger um, are are bigger culprits of this than others. But are you familiar with the trope of linear warriors, quadratic wizards? Yeah, right, right. And that that's Pathfinder Two E has done a good a good amount of work addressing that. I think from a mechanical standpoint, mm -hmm. but yeah, absolutely. And so on Main War even the warriors have access to magic that that enhances as they go up in level two. Uh, it's a bit more natural, like the, the, the examples I gave. Um, but yeah, it's 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 everywhere there. And people, uh, an example, I guess, would be uh, in the nation of Daring, which is the central nation. It's an empire that is very aggressive in, in its expansion. Its elite troops have uh, spell, spell spears, which are spears that have built in fireball, lightning bolt, and I don't recall what the last one is at the moment. Um, and someone can get a hold of those through the black market somewhere else and have extreme power at their fingertips. Um, so, yeah, so it's 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 all over the place there. And don't get me wrong, when you have powerful archmages, they're they're dangerous no matter what you do. But yeah, based on the based on the way you're just the way you're describing it, I will I will admit one thing that ended up ended up coming to ended up coming to mind for me. And this may, this is certainly going to be a stretch, but the um er, the early days. The early crazy days of the Might and Magic series, especially the Heroes series. That is another uh, game I played, maybe a little bit as a as a youth, but not too much. On were there were there were there issues with balance or? <laughs> yes, um, especially Heroes of Might and Magic Two, i.e., uh -huh. i.e., um, local local genie ruins everything. 
Because because seriously, if you had a if you had a genie or a sorcerer, you could j the game was pretty much on the ki on the kind of easy mode that journalists want every From Software g game to be to include. <laughs> it was it 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 be it went beyond making the game too easy and and went into full on cheese. Gotcha. Um. But a a big reason why I bring up that whole line, linear warriors quadratic wizards thing is the is the issue of um of 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 certain casting classes being um being a little being a little bit too useful where they were because of the where they had a spell that that could do they had spells that could do so much that they would dip into what what's supposed to be the gimmick for other characters right um. The biggest offender of this kind of thing, what if you remember from third edition, was the cleric. Yeah, I remember clerics being pretty ridiculous, and like your Ur priest and some other ridiculous things that allowed you to um, basically play play a party as one character, right? Yeah. Yeah, and the, and of course the big offender was um Godzilla, and clerics aren't aren't as aren't as bad with this in in 5th edition or in or in um Pathfinder 2nd. Right. But the but the issue but the issue of mage of mages fix everything can prop up, can cr can crop up or there can be that divide or or glass ceiling between the martial and the magic characters. And si and since magic is going to be is meant to be that level of um commonplace, that's why that's why I was curious about that. The other thing yeah. that I'm the other thing that I'm curious about, especially since you're going with, especially since you're going with a setting, that is ve that is very far removed from the traditional um, avenues. Um, what is what has been your take on spell slots? Oh, interesting. Uh, I don't know. I, mean, I don't really have. I don't think I have. Uh, you mean like just my personal taste on it? Because yes. we don't really address that in the in the books, because you know we're building around these systems with our mm -hmm. setting. But as far as as far as that goes, I I don't know. <laughs> I don't see. I honestly don't know. I guess we get so used to playing what we're playing um, that it, it becomes so natural that we don't address it too much or think about it. But I I, I I'm fine with them. I guess uh, I've always enjoyed playing uh, non prepared spellcasters. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to other systems, what like spell points or or simply like fourth edition, I think where you just had you know abilities across the board and you... some were called spells, but they were all essentially spells, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I see. I see benefits and deficits to to, to all of it. I, I guess I don't really have a strong opinion on them. I mean, I've I've made I've made my issues cl clear with it, but um, truth truth be told, I prefer the idea of of oh, spell casting being as being as much of a skill as anything else. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not a fan of you. Of you, you automatically cast. Oh. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm down with that. I mean, I'd. I'd. I'd love to look at maybe a new system at some point where, where, where. Yeah, where there's a check involved to cast. Maybe um, adding rules is always, you know, could be problematic, but, and that, and that you just, as opposed to it being a, a limited set, um, because you have problems with things like the warlock and other other classes in five e where. They, people just don't feel like they have enough to do, um, except for spamming one final ability. So that can be addressed by that. Yeah, yeah. The um, I what I what we call in the temple the Nova problem. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And yeah, I, I totally understand it. I do get it. Um, and and maybe that's probably why I've played non prepared or spontaneous spellcasters in three five and Pathfinder one e because they get more more of them to throw, even if they have a smaller selection. You know. So yeah, no, I get it. I've heard I've heard that Skip Williams absolutely despised sorcerers when um, third edition first came out. I heard that as well. Um, I mean, supposedly there was a rant on the old Wizards forums, but unfortunately, I can't find it. <laughs> no, but I I, I, de I definitely remember hearing that at some point in the past as well that they were that it was r ridiculed by a, by an important designer. Yeah, yeah, and um, when it now. That that now when it comes to the when it comes to the um cr when it comes to the crunchy end of things, um, I did I did see that there were when they looked at the players guide I did see that there were some uh, that there were some additions, say when it came to feet when it came to feats and the like, for for the various classes in Pathfinder Second Edition, um, 
I'm cur I'm curious it, in both instances are you, are there any full on new classes that you're that you're adding to to the to res the respective games as sandbox or is it mainly expanding the pool of classes that's already present? Right. That's a good question. Um and it, it harkens back to a question you asked earlier too which was how designing um, for these differed between the two systems and if there were hurdles or changes we had to make because of the systematic differences. And the answer to that is, of course, yes. Uh, so here's what we did. In an example would be in fifth edition, uh, well, let me phrase it better. In second edition, Pathfinder second, mm -hmm. there there was no need we found, although you can imagine we went back and forth on a lot of this stuff. And and uh, although we don't get heated with each other, there were definitely some conversations where we disagreed and had to come to middle ground on in Pathfinder Second, we didn't feel at the end of the day that we needed any new classes. The archetype system they've introduced is awesome, and it allows you to make anything as an archetype that doesn't have to be a base class. And quite frankly, one of the areas I disagree with Paizo, love Paizo generally, but one of the areas I disagree with them is some of the classes they have released as base classes later, I wouldn't have made them base classes. I would have made them archetypes as well because I think they made such a good system with archetypes. So. Any new classes at all, we're leaving to them. And we're just doing archetypes there for everything we wanted. But in 5e, it's not built the same. And so while you'd certainly have uh, many situations where we could make an archetype, because I use that same word there often, right, of a class there, um, not everything worked that way. So let me, let me I'm trying to scroll to my example here. Uh, Geomancer um, was something that we <clears throat> made uh, up in the story it was a necessary part of the creation of the nation of Orin, which is the southernmost uh, nation in on Mainwar, the high the high magic continent, mm -hmm. uh, that's run by uh, vampires. But our vampires aren't standard European vampires because you want to do something different, right? Mm -hmm. So the geomancers aren't what they might sound like at first, which would be someone who deals with directly with you know pulling earth up or anything like that. Rather, they're um, they're divine style casters who draw their power from the the world of Zoan, the world that they're on, from the bone to the dead, long since crust to dust, mm -hmm. and the lingering power of a long dead god, because they insist that the planet itself is a long dead god that is once again nascent and, and waking up. So we the idea was so different there that we needed to create a, a new class for it, and we wanted to, so we did. So for 5e, that's a new class, um, and, and it's an archetype in Pathfinder 2nd, right? Yeah. Um, so what that means, of course, is that they need to be rather different. Um, the same ideas where they have a base ability called blood empowerment, mm -hmm. um, which exists in both forms, but it needs to be different for each because of the, the difference in, I guess, power level at each level, but also in how you write abilities out. You know, you know how that goes. There's, there are notable differences in the in the terminology they use and in the design uh, style, I guess, is the for lack of a better phrase. Mm hmm. So uh, so the answer to that is, I think, I believe that's the only, oh no, we, we did that one and we did uh, the Makaziki because in 2E and Pathfinder 2nd, they already have, um, well, gosh, I could go on about that. Let me just say this, this the tease and play test for gears and guns, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're familiar with that, yes. really threw us for a loop, really threw us for a loop. We had had so much designed for our technology that we realized we needed to step back and maybe trash it. It's not trashed yet. It's it's still there, of course, right? But we're working on it uh, day by day as we get more info from Gears because what's the point in recreating something they've done exactly, right? Mm -hmm. And and so we're keeping an eye on that. And that comes out well before we need to put out our finished product. So there's some time there, but we definitely have to revisit it because they went with some ideas with the inventor that we had already written out almost almost verbatim. Mm -hmm. we, we, joke about, we joke about someone at Paizo getting into our notes, which clearly wasn't the case. But... Um, <laughs> for 5e though there is no there is no uh, mechanist there's the artificer which has two problems first of all it's a, a marriage of magic and tech right it's a it's a magic tech tech and second isn't part of their uh, SRD from from the research that I've done yeah. so we we literally can't make something that builds off of the artificer anyway which works because our our makaziki is something different it's purely technological so yeah, we have some new classes. Uh, although the vast majority of what we did builds on what's there, because frankly, it's if it's clean and natural, it's less work for us anyway, and it, we can present what we need to present from a flavor standpoint. Because I'll cap this all off by saying everything we designed, ever in any of this, is designed from a flavor uh, to mechanical flow, mm -hmm. right? 
we need this there because this part of the world has it. Uh, are there mechanics for it that exist? No, we need to make it. So. Yeah, and when when you meant when you described how the geomancer was set up, maybe it's just maybe it's just me, maybe it's just my twisted mind at work, but I. I ended up picturing a. I ended up picturing an argument in the office about whether or not that sh whether or not that should fit into a a subtype of another caster class, um, right. or or not or not. Um, because I could because I remember I remember in the past doing a doing a different setup with a ge with a geomancer that was, um, lar that was largely that was that was largely geared towards divination. Um. Because because I was I was running a Wuxia themed game game at the time and okay. I had to basically throw out all of the casting classes that D and D has. And yeah, they didn't fit for what he needed. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I had to I had to throw out a lot more than just that. I'll tell you. I'll I'll tell you. But um, when I pre when I presented the geomancer the geomancer idea that I that I was running with, um, some people had said, well, because because of how it's tied to. It's tied to the. It's tied to the earth and the land. They're they're like, why, why don't you just why don't you just make this a subtype of druid? And I'm like, because there's because there's no shape shifting in this. Right. <laughs> if you have to change if you have to change too many base, uh, and this this matters more in five e, you know, mm -hmm. but then then Pathfinder second. If you have to change too many base mechanical uh, I don't know, game loops, I don't know what you want to call them, subsystems of a class, then it's easier just to make a new class. And there's a certain point where that threshold is that you have to decide as a designer, but you know, certainly for Geomancer and for Alchemist, uh, that's what we needed to do. Yeah, um, I in my early days I ran Rifts, um, okay. which, as much as I loved the setting, trying to get the thing to work for me was a royal pain, and I had I had like twenty four pages of house rules, and after <laughs> after that I I um put I put in a bit of a I put in a bit of a rule in my list of um mantras, um. House ruling should be a spice, not the main dish. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. That was that's that's a I like that one. That's a that's a tack we took when we built all this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. If it if if you're doing so much work that you that you've that you're that it's not worth the investment, then you there was probably a better way to do it. So yeah. um yeah, and I and by the way, I envy anybody ever designing anything for rifts. I don't hate it, but man, what a system! Well, if you're using Savage Worlds, if you're using the Savage Worlds version of rifts, then half of your problems are solved. Is that okay? Because well, it's sa it's Savage Worlds within the rift system, and Savage Worlds is already pretty flexible as it is. That's one system I need to look into just for education's sake. I haven't even opened a book of it, so. Oh. If you, if I'd say, I'd say the easiest crash course with that is to look at debt is to look at Deadlands. That's okay. how a lot of people first got exposed to Savage Worlds. Um, is but, that the, like the weird? Is that like a weird West one? Yes. Okay, got it. Um, just stay away. If you see a, if you see a Deadlands with a D, with a D twenty stamp on it, stay the hell away from it. Because that's not Savage Worlds, right? Yeah. Well, well, that and it's not, and it's not good. Okay, got it. But. Getting back to saner matters, um, I did want to ask about the alchemist because it's not the first time that I've seen a alchemist class in um, in a in a third in a third party um, project. I had the guy behind Chronicles of Ears on a few months back, and his particular alchemist leans more into leans more into the realm of the kind of alchemy that was seen in the anime Full Metal Alchemist. Right. Um, with the setup that you're going, is it the is it more of the standard? I I know how to make I know how to make potions, bombs, and make and make people grow extra arms kind of thing. So ours, um, goodness. So the alchemist, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. The alchemist that we created does know how to make potions better -er than others. Uh, Right, they have their alchemical distillation so that they can do extra damage with acid, alchemist fire, antitoxin effects, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's definitely there. They're also, depending upon the way the route you go, um, capable arbalists and and such. But the core of the class is based on Newman. So Newman is, um, you know, I spoke earlier about how millennia ago on Mainwar, uh, Ahura and Deva came from beyond and showed up looking for the stuff of God of godhood. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a Newman, uh, which is this 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 essence of divinity that exists within the planet, 
And that ties into the whole thing I mentioned about geomancy, believing the planet itself is a divine entity. Mm-hmm. Um, but Newman, alchemists, the, the foundation of, with alchemists in our setting is that they know how to uh, utilize and distill their Newman, which is the, the essence of divinity within their blood. Um, because everyone has that on Maynor, which is another longer story. Mm-hmm. But they have the ability to make Newman stars from their Newman, which um, they can throw and have <laughs> unfortunate, almost radioactive effects on um, on targets. Uh, but yeah, you know, so so they they do they do potions better than others and salves and antitoxins and things like that. But what it really what they really are based on is the idea of uh, exploring, modifying, and asserting the power of divinity within the blood of everyone on Mainwar per their existence on the continent and also uh, the modifications to their lineages from the Ahura and David that showed up so long ago. Mm-hmm. So we went a little bit different direction. It's still going to be, there's still going to be similarities in any class called Alchemist, I think. But, yeah. Um, and with, and with, now we are, we already, um, we already delved into the, into the, into the, um, G, into the geomancer. Um, but, but since you, since you mentioned the whole thing with, the whole thing with cross, the whole thing with crosswells, that brings me to, to something else I'm curious about. Um, when it comes when it comes to when it comes when it comes to firearms um how are you about re- about um about firing and re- and reloading them okay so in in pathfinder 2nd that one's easier we um we have some rules in place based on uh what we had had combined with modifications based on the teaser for for gears and guns that gave us some info that's that's pretty much there with the action system they have that's easier to deal with in 5e, uh, we just looked at the crossbow, and we went from there, right, with a higher technology level. So uh, let me scroll down here. I have all my notes and everything here. Yeah, so for for firearms, we used the loading property that a crossbow has. Mm-hmm. And then... Well, that's what we did. <laughs> I guess that's the answer to that. We simply use the loading property that crossbows have, and then we have the ability with technological upgrades to reduce the loading property or eliminate it entirely. Is the answer there? All right. I so the it. framework of firearms is the crossbow. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now, when now, bec- given given the um, given the fact that you mentioned that you mentioned. Um, Alchemists using customized crossbows when it comes to their particular payload. Um, I something I'm, something I'm curious about. I'm curious about is it is if they have the potential for misfiring. Firearms, that is right. Yeah, especially yeah. since I th- I think unless I'm unless I'm mistaken the um fi- the fire the firearms are the, are kind of are not not too far removed from pike and shot era firearms. Right. Right. So, so they do indeed have misfire. Um, we we looked at misfire as it had been in prior editions and as it is in current editions, and we weren't uh, too happy with how debilitating it was. I, I I personally don't like how guns were presented in Pathfinder First Edition, although I do like a lot about that system, as I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if it's too debilitating, it undermines how good uh, these are supposed to be. And so it is there, and it's simply this. If you roll a natural one on an attack roll with a weapon that has a misfire property, it jams, and the weapon can't be fired again until an action is used to clear it. Mm-hmm. So that's it. That's as complex as the mechanics get on it, because you simply clear it, uh, so it does take away one shot You know, in the meantime, and then you're able to shoot again with it. Yeah. Uh, no break, no breaking, uh, no elements of, of it being of it possibly exploding in your face, because um, it's just... From a from a this is one area where from a mechanic standpoint it just becomes silly in my opinion or too complex or unfun and I think fun is a really key thing when it comes to games that you do for a hobby. I feel I feel like the chance of exploding should be should be a should be a property not a um not a baked in thing, you know. So yeah, like if, if you if you modify it too much or something, you mean? If that and um. I'm I'm always a, I'm always a sucker for that for the mad scientist archetypes who's oh. who makes some um, who makes who makes equipment and gadgetry that can be certainly powerful but you're rolling dice with god every time you try and fire it. Um, that 
that's that's built into the uh, inventor for Pathfinder Second. So I know what you're talking about, and that it's pretty fun there. Yeah. Um, even though even though it's a more high t high tech example, um, something that I've always called back to with this with this method of thought was the noisy cricket from Men in Black. Sure. You know. Sure. <laughs> deals ridiculous amounts of sonic damage, but knocks you on your ass. Yeah, or 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 on the other side of it, uh, what what when you said it, the first thing that came to mind for me was how in Star Trek how you can set a phaser to explode, right? Mm -hmm. You press you you set it up properly to overload, and you set it there, and boom. So yeah. an experimental thing that you can use offensively rather than just blowing up in your face because there's a five percent chance that you roll that one every single time you roll a d twenty, right? Oh, so. I did, I did, I did, I did have one of my players take advantage of it when he did a call, when he did a called shot that ended up hitting the wrong button. <laughs> so so the so the B bag didn't even didn't even realize that his precious crossbow just blew up in his face. Got it. <laughs> but um given <laughs> given that given what you mentioned about about um reloading and jamming um are are repeater weapons a rarity? Yeah. Yeah, so you know that that goes back to our one of our earlier questions about so I can talk a little bit more about that with technology levels and how you know guns advanced really pretty quickly in the grand scheme of things in real life, right? Uh, it, it, when we go back and look at history and the point at which they were introduced, the point at which they became where they are today or halfway through, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. So for us, we definitely have some varying levels there, and in five um, E, it's a simple matter of making something more expensive and saying that it's rare. In Pathfinder 2nd, it's built in where you can put level requirements on items, right? Mm -hmm. So that people, so you know outright, you can't have this item until you're this level. But yeah, we do have those, uh, but they are rare. So uh, these aren't even in the player's guides because the player's guides only go so far and have so much, you know, based on page count. Mm -hmm. But I definitely know that we have um, per secret church research and thus available only to either armies on the actual battlefield or to the highest level of quay stores uh we're able to get access to them i know we have flamethrowers that's one of our best pieces of art actually is a quay store with a flamethrower and tech mom armor um i don't know if you've seen that one it's in the it's in the player's guide somewhere yeah. um and then something akin to a gatling gun uh, but that's about as far as that goes and uh the the Dajar way the holy hegemony has ships that have cannons as well mm -hmm. um and that's that's the upper limit of it uh, as far as all that goes yeah yeah and now you've put, now you've put the idea in my head of of some bit of some big giant of a player, um, t taking a, taking what would normally be a ship cannon, using that as, as a personal weapon. <laughs> we have had discussions that that will you know that some group is inevitably going to do that. So we have we have had that discussion. Uh, it's already expected for sure. Yeah, because um, some somebody somebody inevitably wants to play wants to play the heavy, um, right? Especially especially give especially given. Like I've I've had that I've had that particular thing brought brought up to me given um one of my players is a fan of Monster Hunter, right. and you've if you've even seen if you've even seen videos of that you've seen the ridiculous um weapons in that series. Yep, absolutely. Um, but one one aspect of the setting that that you're setting up that I'm cu I'm curious on how on how this would play out is the living world method. Um, how, how is, how, what, do, how do you define the, that particular method of campaign creation and how would it play about at a given table? Yeah. So we, um, that was something that we, we really wanted to do as well, because we wanted people to have fun with it. We remembered that they, they, they sort of did this, um, in, well, I'm totally blanking right now in, in th third 3.5. There were some, there was some adventure or campaign where they asked for feedback from player groups after a certain point, and that directed what the official canon was of the outcome. Um, so, what comes to mind when you bring up that kind of thing is the where, where um, during the Alderac era of Legend of Five Rings, the um, tournament scene would dictate how the story would go, especially the uh, Kotai series. Right. Oh, and they did that with uh, Warhammer 40k in in a small they one did, instance that I can they remember. They did that. Yeah. They did that with. They it, they actually did that with Warhammer Fantasy with the Storm of Chaos event and it was a disaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't usually go too well because it's like a it's like finishing a Mortal Kombat game 
and and whoever wins uh whenever you you know beat the game you get a cutscene. but it's it's mutually exclusive with every other person winning so then eventually they have to say who won uh later that's not really what we're going for here but we definitely wanted to get people involved and able to write this with us as we go so um one of the things we're going to be doing is putting out uh you know contacting those who purchase um and tell you know saying thank you and here's an email address where you can send us the outcomes of your campaigns and so without committing wholesale to saying we're going to tell your story mm -hmm. uh we're going to it with people's permission and their desire because i think people will like it we definitely want to uh write the story with those with those outcomes in mind and those changes in mind mm -hmm. so so and because that's the thing is that all the best stories that that people read but let me rephrase that many of the best stories that people read in novels malice and book of the fallen uh raymond e feist's um rift war series those were those were gaming groups those were played at a table to start with and so everyone who's helping write the narrative which is all the players you know forever write that story and so we, what we want to do with this is create that sort of scenario where the gaming group just happens to be a lot larger depending on how many people want to play and let us know mm -hmm. so that's what we mean by by living world we definitely want to have it influenced by other people instead of writing it all ourselves Mm -hmm. We will trust me. We we we, we write uh, too much for our own good, but I you know we thought people might like to get involved in that. All right, I, all right. I can I can certainly get behind I can certainly get behind that. Um, yeah, it's a bit difficult to do it the ways we mentioned, uh, and I I don't think those ever really panned out perfectly. Um, I think I think the big I think the big reason why um, why I did when these with the storm of with the. The only time I've ever I've ever really seen it um, pan out somewhat consistently was the Kotai series, and that and that was because it was able to be a little it was able to be a bit more controlled since it was since the Kotai series was an official um, series of series of tournament events, right? Um, and be and it and it ha and it was it was at the current block the current edition of of Meta, so um so each so so it was. Kind of, it was kind of a precursor to the whole seasonal thing that some that some video games try and do. Um, but, um, but but the result, but because of that, there was also a re a um a referee looking over the thing and making sure that people weren't just sending reports w reports willy nilly. Right. Right. Um. And a a lot of a lot of times those reports were basically faction favoritism, but. Because, but that's a factor that I don't think you have with um, Lost Lights. It's more, it's more about the results of their of uh, their given campaign. So, it's not entirely um, faction centric. Yeah. Not so exactly. Right. No, you're right. You're you're right. One is not faction centric. Two, um, their their stories are unlikely to overlap perfectly. So we can take bits and pieces and still, you know, put what happened in your game in there. And then three. It, it, I mean, I'll be frank with it. It's not a commitment to write a story exactly as presented by a party either. You know, we'll take elements from it. We'd love to have those characters have their day in the sun and and shape the story of of the campaign setting. But at the same time, there's no contract in place that says we've got to do this. Whereas with those, they said ahead of time, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna base this off of the reports of your tournament findings, right? Or and I'm thinking of the 40k one because that's what I'm more familiar with. Um, so then they had was, to it literally. For, it wasn't 40k. It was fantasy. Um, oh, I keep on saying that. I'm sorry. Yeah, Warhammer Fantasy, um, but they had a problem because they they needed to report stuff that they you're saying they weren't able to um, verify at times, right? Yeah, pe people 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 were just people were just sending them reports without actually doing without actually doing battles. There <laughs> right. there wasn't a whole lot of real supervision, and the the story that they had planned was this de was this desperate assault this desperate assault of cha of chaos on the on the forces of order. And um, they basically, they basic because, but when they actually got the reports, chaos ended up getting their faces um, stomped in ten times over. So they had to bullshit their way in, their way into the um, solution that they wanted. Yeah, it also sounds like uh, you, you know what this is coming more and more to mind in my memory. You know, I want it. It also sounds like it's possible that they had a story in mind. They already the a solution resolution in mind. They already wanted, and that. The results flew in the face of that, so they had to figure it out. We don't have that in mind. Yeah, we have some we have some general story story beats and progressions uh, that we know this is going to go through, but uh, it's nothing nothing that would contradict what's done otherwise. Maybe maybe part of their problem was they went with such an epic scale as well. Um, I don't think I don't think there's an issue with with the idea of do, with the idea of doing um, ep doing epic scale. 
but but doing it but doing it in a in a everybody free for all kind kind of kind of movie. Right. Something like something like that really should have been done in stages. Right. Yeah, um, I agree. If I if I could use if I could use any exa any example, think of say um Rush in ba in Battlefield 1. Where it's a where it's a com where it's a mi instead of one giant battle, it's a mix of slightly smaller ba slightly smaller battles um pushing pushing one direction or the other. Right. Um, yeah, that might have behoved them to do it that way instead. Yeah. Um, there's all there's all there's also the there's also the fact that if you if that um that people are get people are gonna find a way to cheese the system, no matter what. You can you can tr you can try and make things as balanced as you can, but somebody's going to find an exploit. And peep and especially when you have as many moving parts as you do in a war game. Um. Right. Obviously, since this is an since this is an RPG with a with a small with a much smaller cast, um, you're not going to have as many moving parts that you have to account for. Right. Exactly. So yeah, I think there are a lot of reasons why it worked better than than what we've been talking about there. So mm -hmm. you know, we'll give it a shot, and I think people hopefully people will like it and, and give us stuff to 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 throw into the story so they can read it later and say, "Oh, wait, that's my group." Well, in lieu in lieu of jinxing. Just to make sure. <laughs> but what are you shooting for as far as a release window? I know I know that I know that you that you've got nine days until the um, Kickstarter wraps up. Yeah, so Kickstarter Kickstarter's uh, funded and uh, and going well. Looks like we're gonna hit that last stretch goal that we have on there currently. Mm -hmm. uh, and and more than double our initial amount, which is great because that just means more art, more organization. Because as you know, art's the, the biggest money sink in all this. Um because people need to get paid properly for putting good art out. Uh, and I agree with that. Um, as far as that goes, that's going to close out in nine days. And then we have, when I say we have almost everything written, I mean, we have everything written except that which we have to watch for. So we, I mentioned Gears earlier with Paizo mm -hmm. and things we have to make edits to and adjustments to. And we've already made some adjustments to things based on people sending us feedback of the player's guides because we're, we'd be stupid not to use that. So we've already used some of that info too. But the thing's essentially written. So, you know, in the interest of being smart about about our about our plans, because everything always takes longer than you expect, mm -hmm. we have what do we put uh, for the PDF digital? We have delivery in January, and then for the hardcover in March. So, those uh, could oh wait, does that say March? One second here. There we go. Hardcover in September. Don't let me misspeak on that too much. Holy cow. Um, that might be an error. I just realized there's an error on there. Okay, got to fix that. Cool. Um, nevertheless, uh, things could be done earlier than that. Uh, the PDF could be out as as soon as uh, you know, cross your fingers, even like November, because so much is written. But that's some, uh, at this point, it's just a matter of ordering art and then getting it right. So that's based on the timetables of the artist's work. Uh, because other than that, it's all you know. We've done all the design work. I've worn so many hats through this. Dar has worn so many hats through this. We're just two people, but we've got it all done uh pretty pretty nicely tied up already so mm -hmm. oh i'll i'll certainly be keeping an eye on how on how it de on how it develops at, through the remaining days and a and afterwards um but with that with that said i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come up to the temple yeah, no, I appreciate it, man. It's been fun, and uh, it's always it's always fun. You can tell I can talk about this forever, so it's always fun to talk about it to someone who wants to hear. Mm -hmm. And uh, just really thankful and excited that you had us, that you were, I was able to come, uh, you know, join. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to whether it's to um, whether it's to go for, go into further detail on Lost Lights or to or to laugh at the at, to the most snake bitten class in Five E being the Ranger. Um, <laughs> the door is always open. It's, yeah, absolutely. We are, because we are not professionals here in the monastery. We're a bunch of assholes. <laughs> um, and of course, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, 
My name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.